Father, again, we want to thank you so much um, for your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we are challenged this morning to think about what it means to be a church member that's not just sitting on the sidelines, but out in the field playing and doing the things that we need to for you. I pray, Lord, that we would be thinking about what that looks like. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us through your word to recognize what the church is supposed to look like for us, what our role in the church is. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be convicted of this challenge, of this question, of whether or not we're going to serve you. And considering, Jesus, what it is that you've done for us, I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be ready and willing to serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, let's go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, we're going to get through more of Ephesians today than we have in the past. Um, because I want to make sure that we finish this book before the seniors graduate. Okay? Um, so that's our goal, is to head towards this as far and as fast as we can. So Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. Okay? And just as a reminder, Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3 are about Paul laying out the theology of what it is that God has done for us. Right? Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. We were sinners. We did not want God. We hated God. But because of God's love and His kindness, right? we were dead in our sin and our trespasses. God makes us alive together with Him. And that gospel truth launches Paul into this next section in Ephesians 4. In verses 1 through 6, Paul basically says that he knows that everybody in the church has a calling to serve God. Okay? And we talked about that calling is going to be played out in such a way where you will have humility and gentleness, patience. You'll bear with one another because we're all sinners in the church. right? And so we need this kind of patience and humility so that we can serve each other even though we're sinners with each other. And we talked about last week how... Um, that sounds hard. That sounds really hard to be able to work together with sinners um, because we all, you know, have deficiencies in certain areas. But we talked about how last week God gives us family, right? And family is an illustration of what the church is supposed to be like, where we love each other regardless. We bear with one another because we're joined together by the same blood, right? And what the Bible teaches us is that the church is also a family joined not together by physical blood, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that thing that joins us together and makes us a family is Jesus' blood. And so what Paul's going to do in this next section is he's going to show us okay, how we do that and what God has given to us in order to do that. Okay? So let's look at verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Okay? So what I want to do is let's start in verse 7. It says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay? So what Paul is doing is he's saying all of us have a calling to serve the church, to serve God's kingdom in some way. Okay? And the way that God's going to do that is through our attitudes, first, our character, first and foremost, through, again, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love for the sake of unity. But God gives us more than that. He doesn't just say that this is the attitude you need to have, and I give you this calling. He's going to give us grace to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So the best way I know to explain is this. Jesus Christ, right, when you become saved, he grants you spiritual gifts. And these spiritual gifts are accompanied by God's grace, which enables you to use these gifts. Okay? So if a moment, imagine for a moment, okay, that we're all construction workers working for the same construction company, and we are all hired to do this one job. We're supposed to build the new building, okay? A new building. And so the the the, the leader of the, the CEO, the president of the company, right, he, he grants each of you guys, right, these tools that you're gonna use to build the building. Okay, so some people he's going to give them a chainsaw, some people he's going to give them um, you know, hammers and nails, and other people he's going to give pencils. Okay? So the people with pencils, what are they going to do with those pencils? What is their job in terms of creating a building? It's to draw, right? It's to, to measure out things, draw things, plan everything out, make sure the building is straight and not crooked, make sure it's safe, the foundations are set, all that kind of stuff. Right? Or you're going to use pencils to nail, ham uh, to nail nails into wood, to hammer nails into wood. No, you're not, because a pencil can't do that. Okay? You'll hurt yourself if you do. 
What do you do with hammers and nails? Do you draw with those things? I mean, I, you could, but it would turn out pretty terrible. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put wood together, right? What do you do with a chainsaw? What do you do with a saw? You cut wood, right? So everyone's going to have these specific gifts so that they can serve this building together. They're going to have these specific tools so that they can serve and build this building together. Now, the grace part, okay, because this is an illustration, the grace part is the training and the desire for us to actually want to build this building. So even if you have a pencil or you have a hammer and nails or you have a chainsaw, if you don't want to build this building, you're not going to be invested in it. You're not going to actually participate in it. This building is not going to get built, right? But if you have a desire and you have the training in terms of how to use all the tools that you're given, then you can build this thing together. And what does God tell us about the church? Verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So does anybody in the church not have a gift from Christ? No. Does anybody in the church not have a measure of God's grace to be able to build into the church? The answer again is no. Every single one of us, those of us who are truly saved, we all have this. This is Christ's gift to us. And then what Paul does, he gives an illustration in verse 8. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And so what Paul does is he actually quotes from Psalm chapter 68. And Psalm 68 is really this story about a king, okay, who goes off to war, conquers the other nation, brings back all of the things that they own, okay, and comes back to his people and gives it to all the people. That's what Psalm 68 is about. It's a psalm about this king that goes off, conquers, comes back, and gives gifts to all of his people. And what, the reason why that's unique is because that's not how war usually worked. War generally worked like this. If the king went out into battle, conquered another nation, they would bring back everything and it would come into the king's household. This is how the kings got wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, right? And so if the king wanted to give stuff to his people, he could. But generally speaking, the king kept everything. Okay? But in Psalm 68, we praise God because he's not that kind of king. Right? He conquers sin and death and then he grants to us all of these different kinds of gifts. And it says in verse 9, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of earth? He who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And what Paul is basically doing is he's talking about Psalm 68, okay? And he's quoting it saying, the way that we know that we have these spiritual gifts is because that's the attitude of God. That's the heart of God to give these gifts out. But then there's a parenthesis, right? All of your Bibles in verse 9 through 10 have a parenthesis. It's almost as if Paul is making a comment on Psalm 68 and saying, but the way that Jesus is different from Psalm 68 is that a king goes out to battle and he comes back home. But Jesus, the way that he conquered sin and death was he left his home, came down to us, right? He left his heavenly kingdom. He left his heavenly home. He left all the things that he had in heaven, including his intimate relationship with God to become like us to wrap himself in clothing like our clothing in flesh and blood. Right? So he became one of us, and then on the cross, he also absorbed all of our sin. Right? And so what Paul is doing is he, he's inserting the gospel and basically saying that the reason why you should value the gifts that God has given to you is because of the payment that God paid to give these gifts for you. Right? Imagine, okay, imagine, that a friend of yours comes to you and gives you a car, just a simple car, okay? And in it is a message from your friend talking about how this is going to be his last day on earth, okay? That he knows that he's going to die today and he decided that he was gonna write you a car, okay? Would you treat that car differently from any other car that you've ever received? Of course you would, why? Because the meaning of it is so much greater because of what it costs your friend to write that car to give to you. If this was going to be his last day on earth, and he was going to write cards to his parents and to his family members and to all the people that he loves, if he gives you one that says that you were important in his or her life, right, and that suggests that this thing is important, you would hang on to that. And so that's what Paul is commenting on here in Ephesians. He's basically saying, look, all of us have these gifts that Christ has given to us, and I don't want you to take these gifts lightly. They were really, really, really expensive. Christ gave his life so that you could have these gifts. Okay. What are those gifts? Let's go to verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay? So we're going to start here. This is not all the gifts, all the spiritual gifts that are laid out in the Bible, but this, these are the ones that are mentioned here, so we'll start here. So I want to focus on apostles and prophets. So what kind of gifts did Christ give to the church? The apostles and prophets. So the apostles are the twelve, right? So we're talking about the eleven original disciples. And I say eleven because the twelfth was Judas, and Judas died. Paul replaces him in regards to when we talk about the twelve apostles, right? So Paul is the twelfth apostle. And so you have the twelve apostles. These are the men who established the church, right? They're the ones who grew the church. They're the ones who wrote about the church. They're the ones who wrote the New Testament. They're the ones who went around planting the church, evangelizing, growing the church. Okay? And then it says, and the prophets. Okay? Now, these were men that also were around during the time of the New Testament. They also wrote scripture, okay? And they also spoke for God in the sense of doing ministry alongside these apostles. So the apostles and the prophets are really the men that put together the Bible, so, we know who wrote 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, Peter and John, who wrote Timothy and Ephesians and Colossians and pretty much, like, what, 60% of the New Testament? Paul wrote those. But then you also have Luke, Mark, right, and James. Right? James was not an apostle, Luke was not an apostle, Mark was not an apostle. But these three were disciples of the disciples, right? So James was actually the brother of Jesus. He became the leader of the church, even though he wasn't originally a disciple. Uh, Luke was a disciple of Paul, and Mark was a disciple of Peter. Right? And these guys are considered the prophets here who wrote scripture so that the church can have a good foundation. Because once these men died, once that first generation of church leaders died, what they left us behind with, what they left behind was the Word of God. And so the Word of God becomes what we build the church on top of. So moving forward, the gifts that God gave to us are the apostles, the prophets, Basically, the New Testament that we use to build the church on top of. And then it says, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Okay? And evangelists <clears throat> are not the people that are, that are the only people in the church that are supposed to evangelize. Okay? The truth is, all of us are supposed to evangelize. All of us are supposed to share the gospel. All of us are supposed to know the gospel and share with our friends, family, etc. Now, there are certain people that have been granted a special kind of gift of evangelism. And these are the kinds of people usually that can't stop talking about the gospel wherever they go. They're constantly talking about it. They often end up being missionaries somewhere, right? And so again, this is a gift that God gives to the church so that the church can grow, right? Without evangelists out there preaching the gospel, telling people to come to these churches, a lot of churches would not be filled with people, okay? And then you have shepherds and teachers. Some of your translations say pastors and teachers, okay? And the reason why those are separated is because um, there are people who have a gift of teaching but not necessarily the gift of being a shepherd. Okay? And the difference between the two is one person can teach in regards to the mind, okay? give you the information you need, help you to learn. And then there's other people who are shepherds, and they're aiming more for the heart. Right? They're aiming more to give you advice, to counsel you, to encourage you, to cry with you, to empathize with you, to sympathize with you, and all of the kinds of things that typically goes along with what you think of when you think of a pastor. Right? It's also a leader, right? Because shepherds also lead, guide, and protect their flock, right? And that's the role. So you have three roles that Christ gives to the church that are functioning now. The evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. And what is those three positions? What's their job? It's to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, right? The evangelists, shepherds, and teachers' job is not to do all the work inside the church. It's to get and help and train the rest of the church to do the work of the church, right? It's not that there are professionals who do ministry and then everyone else just receives ministry, but the proper way it's supposed to work is everyone's supposed to do ministry and there are special people that are raised up with spiritual giftings to help everyone train in that, okay? That's the idea. And what's the goal? Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of we're trying to all become more and more like Christ every single time we gather together, every single day. What can we copy from Christ? How can we be more like Jesus? Now, some of you guys are thinking already, okay, Pastor Kevin, you said that everyone has a gift. I am not an apostle. I am not a prophet. I am not an evangelist. I am not a shepherd. I am not a teacher. 
Well, it turns out, this is not the only list of spiritual gifts that are inside the Bible. Okay? There are others, but I want to share specifically with you the one from Romans. So Romans 12, verse 6 through 8 says this. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. In prophecy in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. I'll briefly explain these. So prophecy is the ability to know what God's word says, okay, and use God's word in appropriate settings. Okay? Oftentimes, teaching and prophecy kind of cross over. So sometimes teachers, we get moments where we have the gift of prophecy kind of flow out from us. Right? And it's kind of when we're teaching a lesson and we, a Bible verse pops into our head or a story from the Bible pops into our head and we use that for the lesson. Okay? So if you know enough of the Bible, you can utilize that in teaching situations. You can utilize that in counseling sessions. You can utilize it when you're talking to your friends and talking to people and that becomes sort of the gift of prophecy. Okay? It's not the ability to predict the future. Okay? If someone comes up to you and says, I'm a prophet, and I know what your future holds, drop everything and run. Okay? Do not trust them. Okay? <clears throat> and that says, if service in our serving. Now, what's really interesting is, this is so broad and so general. Right? What does it mean that there's a gift of service? Well, it just means that you have a unique ability to want to always be the kind of person that's in the background helping with whatever needs to be helped with. The reason why this is general and broad is because the church is not something that is super narrowly defined, right? The church is an international organization over all countries, all languages, all cultures, and so there's gonna be different places and different things to do in terms of serving. Some churches are gonna require men to come early and set up chairs and set up a sound system and do all this stuff. Other churches don't even have a roof or chairs. So the men of those churches are going to do different kinds of things. Right? Some churches, there's going to be food every single week. Right? There's going to be people that need to come and serve in that regard, like our church. In other churches, that's not needed. What they need is they need people in, in the front of the church to welcome people and do different kinds of things like that. And so the idea is that serving is really a general, broad term because there are tons of things that you can do in regards to serving. It takes a desire. Right? And then obviously teaching is teaching. The one who exhorts in his exhortation Exhorting doesn't simply mean encouraging, okay? It actually means more of leading somebody in the right direction. So if that includes encouraging, that's fantastic, okay? But sometimes it also means correcting. So if someone's doing something wrong and you see that they're doing something wrong and you clearly that they're doing wrong, you are exhorting them, you are encouraging them in the faith by telling them they're wrong. Kind of like what I told you guys earlier with the worship team. Do that for us. If we're off track, rebuke us. Show us that we're not doing what we're doing. Well, and then it says the one who contributes in generosity, there are people who have just an overflowing heart. They constantly want to give, 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 give. And then it says the one who leads with zeal, there is a gift of leadership. And then it says the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, right? So this is somebody that's constantly walking around trying to care for people, right? Now, you might be saying, I don't think I have any of these either, right? Well, you do. Because Ephesians 4, 7 says, Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Which basically means everyone has something. Okay? If you don't know what you have, it's because you haven't exercised your gift. And you have not been in a position to exercise your gift. Right? If you're not involved in any kind of spiritual ministry, then you have no idea what your spiritual gift is. If you have never exercised spiritual, any kind, if you have never been involved in any kind of spiritual ministry, you have no idea if any of these things apply to you. Right? And here's the thing. You don't go to a church that doesn't have opportunity. We have ample opportunities for you guys to serve, plug into the church, and figure out what your spiritual gifts are. Right? Like our elementary department. From preschool all the way up until junior high, you guys can go and serve in any one of those departments. You can. You just have to have the willingness to do that. While you're there, while you are serving, you'll discover if you do have any of these gifts. Right? Are any of these things applicable to you as you serve the young church, as you serve the younger generation underneath you guys, the younger students who are growing up in their faith? 
And what's crazy is, right, right now especially, right, we're in VBS season, right, which means that we need a lot of volunteers to help us put on this week-long sort of youth, uh, children's evangelistic event where we want to walk through the children's, do a really super fun program, and teach them about who Jesus is every single day, Tuesday through Friday in June. Right? And we've been making announcements, telling you guys to volunteer, 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 volunteer. Serve, 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 serve. It's good for you guys. You will discover things you didn't discover. And a lot of you guys are saying, you can't do it. You're making excuses for yourself. Right? And you're saying things like, I can't be there that week of the VBS, so I don't think I should be serving. Okay? I have a question. Okay. If, if you're in that boat, and you're, in that, you're in that situation where you're like, I'm going to be traveling, I'm going to be out of the country, I'm not going to be in town that week, does it make sense that if you can't give 100% that you should give zero? Does it make sense, right, that if you come to God and God asks you, hey, how come you didn't serve? You would say, God, I, I want to give you 100%, but I couldn't give you 100%, so I, I decided to give you nothing. Right? A lot of you guys have prepared, been preparing Mother's Day presents, right? <clears throat> would your mother be honored if you said, Mom, I really want to get you a car. I want to go all the way to get you a Mercedes. But I couldn't, so I got you nothing. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> right? Your mom's like, Mom, get out of the house! Yeah. Oh, right? It doesn't make sense. But why do you do this to God? Jesus Christ died on the cross so that he could raise again, be resurrected, go into heaven, through the Holy Spirit, give you spiritual gift. And if you just take that and you go, but I, can't, I can't give you 100% with this, so I'm just not going to give you anything. You just put it down and you walk away. What are you telling Jesus? <clears throat> that his life, his death, his resurrection means nothing to you. But that's not true. I know that Christ means something to you. I know you love Jesus. But let's not live in this world where we think that if we can't give 100%, that somehow God is honored with zero. That doesn't make any sense at all. If you can't give 100%, give 90, give 80, give 50, give 10. God, again, gives us grace according to the measure of Christ. Some people are going to have the ability to give 100%, and they're going to go live in some crazy country, and they're going to be missionaries for the rest of their life. Some people are going to do that. Others of us, that's not what we're called to do. But where we're called, we should be serving as much as we can. Even in regards to our finances, right? Jesus doesn't tell us, God doesn't tell us, you need to give 100% of your income to me. He could have, because it all belongs to him, but he doesn't do that. He says 10%. Everyone can give 10%, because 10% is a percentage. If you made a dollar, you can give a dime. If you made $5, you can give 50 cents. Okay? I don't want to do more complex math, so just take it from there. Okay. But the idea is that, again, you can give something. And as you get involved in that something, these verses, these gifts are going to come up and they're going to bubble up to the surface and you're going to realize, I can do this and this is what I can give to the church. And it's all different, right? It's all different. Not everyone is meant to be in the front. Not everyone's meant to be in the back. It just depends. And I just want to encourage you, even for VBS, look, if you can't be there that week, there are things you can do short term. We need people to help us take pictures while everyone's preparing so we can put that together in a volunteer video later, right? So a lot of you guys have cameras. You love taking pictures. Your Instagram is filled with pictures of yourself. So let's focus on a different subject, but we can work with you on that. <clears throat> um, like the skit team, for example, right? The skit team needs costumes, right? Every year that I've been on the skit team, I've been dying to have really awesome costumes because I know that the kids respond to that. Right? When the kids are sitting in the service and there's a skit going on and they're not wearing costumes, it's not nearly as fun and attention getting as when the skit team's coming out and they have all these crazy costumes. Well, guess what? The skit team's so busy practicing, they can't make those costumes. But what if you, because you can't serve that week in June, but what if you could for the next three weeks just help the skit team make costumes, right? Like that would be you contributing in a huge way without you saying, I can't be there on Give 50, give, give a couple hours, okay? Now, BBS does require a commitment. This year, I've asked all of the pastors in the education department to cut the commitment down so that we don't have any more excuses. Because that's another thing we do, right? We say, well, I can't give 100%. You're demanding 100%, so I gotta give zero. We're not demanding 100%, right? That, that requirement is gone. You give what you can, we will take it, we will accept it. Because we know that a lot of you guys need an on-ramp to start serving. 
And who knows, what if you do VBS and what if you discover that you're really good with kids? What if you discover that you're really passionate about them, that you really want to lead them? Right? How great would that be for you guys to discover this at your age? The truth is, our education department, I've always believed that you guys can be teachers in the education department. Because I don't look at you guys like children. Okay? Some of you guys have driver's licenses. You drive. Children should not be driving on the road. <laughs> All right, I don't think of you guys as kids. I think that you guys, with the right teaching, with the right motivation, with the right training, you can be teachers and teach over elementary students. And you can be their spiritual leaders. I believe that. I've seen that. But again, how are you ever going to know that that's your calling unless you actually step in and try it? Do you know how I know I'm not called to elementary department? Because I worked in VBS for years. And I suck at it. I can't talk to kids. I can't stand kids. You know why? Because their stories are boring. Have you ever sat there and listened to a kid's story? Oh my god, did this happen? Right. Are you my son? Okay, then I don't care. <laughs> That's my idea to children. I just, I can't do it. I get bored to tears, right? Even with my son, my eyes start to glaze over. <laughs> when he's talking about robots and Optimus Prime and what he did at school, I'm like, oh, oh, oh I'm trying, I love you. Um, it's hard, it's hard. But I know some of you guys, that's a skill you have. Right? Not that you can identify with the kids, but you love hearing their, their voices, looking at them, and you think it's so cute and adorable, and blah, blah, blah. We need you guys in those departments because we need people that care about kids to be there for the kids at our church. We need it. Okay? The body needs this. Okay? All right. So let's move on. So, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we're doing all of this so that we can build the body of Christ together. And again, this is something I don't want you to miss out on, right? All of us should be in a position where we are doing this for each other. Does that make sense? I would hate for you to become 70 years old, look back on your life, and realize that you never helped another Christian become more mature. That would be a tragedy, right? I want you guys to be thinking about this now. How can I help my friends and the, and the people that are younger than me? How can I help them mature and become more like Christ? Because, verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Okay? You guys know this, right? Seniors, when they go to college, 70 to 80% of college freshmen stop going to church even if they were heavily involved in youth group. And the number one reason for that is because they were tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. They believed in the world. They did not believe in what God had told them about anything. Some of them weren't even taught properly, and we won't get into that. But the idea is that, look, my job as a shepherd, as a pastor, as a teacher, is to protect you from bad ideas. This is why we're doing the Truth Matters conferences. In fact, this year, I've already talked to some of the leadership at our church about this, we're thinking about taking the Truth Matters concept and spinning it off to another ministry so that we can serve more young people so that they wouldn't be affected by this kind of stuff. Because I know there's churches that don't have access to the kinds of teachers and the kinds of event uh, opportunities that we have. And the idea is that this matters to me because the reason why we want you to grow up into the fullness of Christ is so that you're not affected by bad, terrible, worldly ideas. Because that's what rips you away from the body of Christ. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The idea is every single person in the body is supposed to serve the body. Right? Every single body part on your body is really important. It matters. Even if you cut off your pinky toe, you lose your balance, right? If you cut off your pinky on your hand, you lose the ability to do certain things with your hand. And again, all of this is important because what Paul is teaching us is that this is God's vision for the church. That we would be people that come and serve one another. And I want to end kind of with this illustration. Okay? Imagine that we are on a basketball team. Imagine that all of us are on a basketball team. Okay? And we all have different positions. Because how many positions are there on a basketball team? Five. Okay, and they are center, forward, guard, and I don't know what those two are. <laughs> Isn't forward, it? And forward and another guard, right? Right? All right. Two guards, two forwards, and a center. Okay. And basically, imagine that we're a we're a, a Christian basketball team, okay, and God has given to us talents. Okay, we we'll call those gifts. Okay. 
and he's given us these positions. Okay? So the tall people, right? Because you're already tall, he's made you the sinners. Right? All you small, stocky, like really awesome looking guys, you are point guards. <laughs> you are a defensive line. Okay. Um, and so what happens is God's going to give you, according to who you are, right, the things you're interested in, the things that you love, the things that you're good at, he's going to give you these gifts. Okay? And so we're playing a basketball game, and we look out, and there's five of us on the court. We're all sitting on the bench. Okay? And the five that are on the court, they're doing everything. They're, they're jumping around, they're shooting the basket, they're doing all that stuff. And they're getting tired. Right? And they're getting burnt out because they're playing 100% of the game. And if you're standing there in the bench and you're complaining that your team sucks, okay, and we're like, oh man, how come our team sucks? Those guys, man, they can't do anything. And the coach says, okay, well, they're tired. They've been playing this entire game. Why don't you go on in and join? Okay? And if you say, no, I don't want to, okay, are you being a team player? Is the team that treats each other like that, are we ever going to be able to win a championship? Or are we going to end up like the Lakers to see? <laughs> we can't. Without good teamwork, we're never going to be able to do the things that we want to do. We all have to be involved. If there's somebody selfishly sitting on the bench saying, I don't want to get involved, I don't want to do whatever, I don't want to contribute, it's going to be very hard for us to be successful in doing what we need to do. Right? And so what I want to see instead okay, is all of us Begging to be on the field, right? I want to be the kind of basketball team where we're like, dude, there's 150 of us. Let's just all play together. Let's just all join the court together. The other team's like, that's cheating. I'm like, nah, this is how it works. <laughs> this is how church every day plays basketball. 150 versus five. Because we all want to be on the court, right? That's the way that it should look. And I would love for us to be that kind of ministry, to be that kind of church. And here's the truth. A couple weeks ago, you know how we prayed? Like, God, help me find a vision. Help me find a calling for my life. Guess what? God's saying... I answered your prayer. If you really want a calling, if you really want a vision, if you really want a purpose, then you need to serve the church. In the midst of serving the church, you will discover spiritual gifts that you didn't know you had before. Start small, okay? And then expand from there. But step in, be in the game, dribble the ball a little bit, and you'll figure out what you're good at. I see you close your eyes. Heavenly Father, again, we come um, humbled at the fact that you would love us so much, that you would die on the cross for our sins, resurrect, go to heaven, and then be thinking about us enough to give us amazing gifts that give our life purpose, that give our life vision, that give our life calling, that give our life meaning. And a lot of us are lost right now because we don't know how to discover those things in our lives. But I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to serve, that you would help us to be involved in meaningful worship, in meaningful spiritual um, ministry, so that we can discover what these gifts are, so that it would lead to greater joy, greater passion, greater things in our life. It would fulfill us, Lord, from the inside. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would challenge us to think about ways in which we can serve you, to think about ways in which we can give you whatever we can give. And I pray, Lord, that your grace would extend to us now as we think and talk and discuss about these things. In Jesus' name.